Good day everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Thomas Henley and today we're going to address autistic rejection sensitive dysphoria. Something that you may have heard before in the context of ADHD, but something that I would like to explain further in the context of autism. How do you overcome it? What is it exactly? Uh, what does it look like? What are some of the things that you can do in your life to get over it, to move past it so that it's not something that you experience on a regular basis. We're going to get into all of that within this video. So what exactly is RSD? It's a difficulty regulating your emotions when faced with failure or rejection. Now you may be asking to yourself, well, Thomas, doesn't everyone not like failure and rejection? Isn't that just a normal part of human existence? Well, yes. Uh, for a lot of people who could be seen to have RSD, they tend to have a lot more of an intense experience with failure and rejection when compared to your average person. It tends to be a lot stronger than your average person. It tends to be a lot more intense. And the threshold for noticing and categorizing something as failure or rejection is a lot lower. So things like vague interactions, vague responses, vague changes in someone's body language, facial expressions, vocal tonality, can all cause some level of rejection, feelings of rejection, feelings of failure, even if it's not totally apparent that that's what's happened to most people. It can also be related to a difficulty controlling your reactions to said failure or rejection, meaning that, as I said, compared to your average person, these reactions that you have tend to be a lot more out of proportion um, for the actual situation. You might have heard about RSD mostly in the context of ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or certain personality disorders. But today I want to dive into the autism side of things because I feel like there's a lot of reasons why autistic people might be more likely to experience this. But we'll get into that in a second. The thing about rejection sensitive dysphoria is that it's not a diagnosable condition. It's not in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, for Mental Health, the DSM. It's something that has been talked about within the psychiatric communities. It's been talked about quite online in terms of the autism, neurodivergent advocacy spaces, particularly on social media. And so it is used to characterize a certain profile for somebody who really, really struggles with that feeling of rejection and those feelings of failure. So what are the proposed symptoms? What can you look out for if you are thinking that, hey, you know, I know other people experience rejection failure negatively. It's like, it's never a fun thing for a human being to experience, but I do feel like in a lot of instances when, when this happens for me, it's it tends to be like a little bit over proportion, like even to myself when I look back at it. Well, let's have a look at some of the symptoms. You might be a person who is more easily embarrassed or self-conscious. You might find that any time where you're in a group situation or if you're meeting someone new, someone who you're not very close to, whether you're in a class, at a workplace, anything like that, you may very much overanalyze um, what's going on. You might make some hiccup uh, during something that you're saying, and it might just feel like it's the end of the world for you, when in reality, it's just a small hiccup. The next symptom is low self-esteem. If you're quite a low self-esteem individual, it's more likely that feelings of failure and rejection are going to impact you a lot more. Another symptom might be a trouble containing emotions when you feel rejected. You might be able to think about the fight, flee, freeze, fawn response. You know, fight being the when when your adrenaline kicks up, do you combat? Do you turn into a combat situation? Do you run away from that situation? Do you try to, you know, make up for it in some way? Do you, do you excessively talk and, and try to make sure that the situation is good? Or do you freeze and do you shut down? If you feel like any of these um, in situations when you do experience failure, or rejection over the top, mind you, that could be a pointer towards RSD. But it's not always these outward facing reactions. And this is something that I personally experienced when it comes to failure and rejection, particularly in my adolescence, when I was a bit younger in my early 20s. I found that a lot of the reactions that I had to feelings of failure and rejection was 
less so on the outward side of things. And it was more an, an internal thing. So I, I sort of inwardly faced. I kind of looked like it didn't bother me. People would, you know, say that I'm a bit nonchalant about it. But inside, you know, after the facts and maybe for a little bit after, uh, my mood just drops a lot. My self-esteem goes down. It really, really impacts me on kind of a deeper level. It's not something that I experienced at this point in my life, but definitely when I was a bit younger. You might also act a little bit more people-pleasing than most people to avoid that feeling of disapproval. You might even turn into a perfectionist in order to satisfy like a, a very authoritarian boss, someone that you're in a relationship who's, you know, you're not feeling that safe with. Uh, you might very much be become that kind of people pleaser to avoid those feelings of failure and rejection. Another way that you might go about trying trying to avoid these feelings is by avoiding circumstances where these could come up. And this could be as small as perhaps going to a social event and trying to make friends, or it could be as big as starting a project or starting a new job or setting up your own business. These things all carry with them different levels of a possibility to fail. And if you are a person who really struggles with that, it's obviously going to be a lot more of a daunting thing to start in the first place. You might also feel like you need to be a bit more of a perfectionist. You, you compensate for your difficulty um, failing or being rejected for something that you've done, some kind of work that you've done, by spending way too much time ironing out the fine details that no one's going to notice. But in your mind, you're trying to reduce the amount of variables possible um, so that you don't get rejected, you don't feel that feeling of failure. So we've talked a little bit about the signs, the symptoms, whatever you want to call them, of RSD. What about the causes? Are there any actual causes of RSD? And people are not necessarily clear on this. A lot of the hypothesis about why it could happen is, is likely due to past experiences. You know, obviously if you've grown up um, feeling like failure and rejection um, is not right and it's not an okay to, thing to experience as a human being. It's something that you should avoid at all costs or you perhaps have some unfavorable dynamics with friendships or romantic relationships or with, with, with parents even. Then it's likely that that could be a source of developing RSD. But there have been some discussions about the co-occurring factors um, in someone developing RSD, it tends to be individuals, as I said before, with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but other personalities and mood disorders too. The hypothesis behind why this might occur is a lot to do with the way that an ADHD brain regulates internal communication. Some of the differences in the filters and the regulation of signals within the brain, within the nervous system, may not be as active, and so sometimes perhaps a little bit less inhibited, disinhibited rather. And of course, you know, with the title of this video, I'm going to be talking about autism, but we do have to cover something before we do, we go there. Get it, we'll wait a second for that. Can you treat RSD? We're not totally clear on that either, or at least from what I've seen. A lot of the medications that have been put forward to help people deal with with RSD have either been alpha-2 receptor agonists. Um, you might know some medications like clonidine or gu guanfa <laughs> guanfaxine. I think I said those right. It's very difficult to pronounce the names of drugs. I had a god-awful time trying to do it at, do it at university. But these alpha-2 receptor agonists basically um, activate those brain areas, making it easier to regulate internal communication. And of course, the more known medications for ADHD, which are the stimulants, things like Adderall, things like Ritalin, if you, if you know about those two, these basically make the brain communicate more effectively. They increase the excitatory uh, neurotransmitters that go, go through your brain, effectively in increasing the ability of those neurons to communicate with each other. There is also the MAO inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, antidepressants, it's a type of antidepressant, and this basically flattens someone's mood profile. 
You can imagine if someone gets out of control emotionally when experiencing rejection or failure, that flattening out their mood profile is obviously going to reduce the intensity of that emotion. Lastly, you know, bar medication, because that is definitely not, <laughs> probably going to be not everybody's go-to when dealing with RSD. Psychotherapy, particularly psychotherapy that focuses on processing rejection and emotional control, can be beneficial to some people. So, what what about autism, Thomas? You've been talking about RSD, about the symptoms and causes, and what we can do about it, but what where does autism come in here? Well, this is actually not as well researched as the other areas, and indeed, the other areas are not the most heavily researched areas anyway. But RSD can trigger mental health issues, uh, anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders. There is a very big crossover with autism and mental health conditions and a lot of crossover between RSD and mental health conditions and ADHD, of course. There is also an aspect of pattern seeking, which I think is, you know, is quite an integral part of an autistic brain. We tend to be very good at lateral thinking, divergent thinking, tying concepts and pieces of information together. And so if you're very hypervigilant towards noticing rejection and you're naturally that kind of pattern seeker type brain, you're going to notice some patterns in people's behaviors. And so little things, little changes in people that you've noticed, even if, even if rejection or, or feelings of failure are not going to come from that, might trigger you to feel those feelings in the first place because you're just, you're just kind of looking for these signs that you've seen before and saying, okay, if this happens, then I know this is going to happen. And so you're already prepping yourself for it. There is also uh, the past experiences element. So autistic people disproportionately experience a lot of horrible things in life. I say this in a lot of my podcasts and my videos, but type in autism and pretty much any bad thing that can happen to a human being. And it's, it's very likely that you know, you're going to see some statistics that you weren't expecting, or at least you will expect it from me saying that, but just in general, you know, might, might, might shock you a little bit if you do like doing a research project like I was and um, seeing these horrible statistics that just reflect your life so well uh, to, to a point where it feels, makes you feel less alone, um, makes you feel less special to some degree, but also you know, pre pretty, pretty depressing. <laughs> so this past experience is a big aspect of it. Scarcity is also a really big thing. With being autistic, we tend to experience a lot of negative experiences with people, of course. Um, bullying, discrimination, difficulty finding a partner, difficulty maintaining, finding, making friends, maintaining familial relationships. These are all things that we could find a lot harder than most people. And so sometimes we have a bit more of a negative bias towards our experience, particularly with non-autistic people, neurotypicals. And so in our heads, we're, we're already thinking that if, you know, we come across someone who is good and who is showing us interest, perhaps like in a dating scenario, or we're having a workplace who is really heavily considering us as part of um, perhaps joining the organization and being part of a job role. Um, we might feel like these are far and few between, that we're never going to have this opportunity again, or at least it's going to be a year from now, or it's going to be two years, or it might be a decade. And so this puts an immense immense pressure on you to succeed in that moment. And so if you do fail and you do get rejected, it's going to hit you so much harder. The last thing is the, the the social difficulties with neurotypicals. And I feel like this is a big one because, you know, we, we do communicate differently. We tend to be a lot more direct instead of indirect with our vocal tonality, body language, facial expressions. Uh, we tend to not really enjoy small talk or be good at it in a lot of circumstances because of that. We tend to have a lot of our interests that we're, we're happy to talk about at length um, and not really notice if the other person is enjoying listening to us or is, is wanting to move on to something else. 
and vice versa. So there's a lot of ways that we are different socially to neurotypicals and that can cause us to have a lot of negative reactions with people. You know, people make assumptions about the way that we are because the way that we are interpreted because of our traits might shift their view on us because you, know, you can you can think of something small like eye contact. Like if you don't make as much eye contact with someone, they see you to be less trustworthy, a bit shifty, perhaps not interested in you or what you're having to say. Whereas like for me, if I'm looking away from somebody, especially if they're talking to me, I'm I'm trying to reduce the amount of sensory input that I'm having in order that I can focus exactly on what they're saying and think about what they're saying to such a like a more heightened degree. That's just what what I'm like. But people might misinterpret that. And there's a lot of ways that neurotypicals can misinterpret our behavior and to be honest, the other way around too. And that sometimes could indicate that we might be failing in the interaction or we might be, you know, just a few sentences away from being rejected. But what can you do about this? You know, you've you've come across this video, you're learning about RSD, all, all of this stuff, you know, Thomas says it could be something related to autism. There are a few good things in there that I'm, I'm sure um, need to be looked into a bit more in terms of scientific research. But what can you do about this? If you are just absolutely overwhelmed with starting anything new because you, you're so fearful or talking to anyone new because you're so fearful of being rejected, it's not a good place to be. It really holds you back in life. So one of the, the, the top ways that I would suggest is find a good therapist. And this is by no means an easy feat. I just have to be honest. If you're within the general healthcare um, in the UK, sure, you might you know, really strike strike the iron and just find someone who really understands autism and can also help you process these emotions. Likelihood is probably not. The best option is to go private, of course, and that would cost money and you, you'd have to do that anyway if you were, you know, from countries like America. You'd have to pay for a therapist. What can you look for in, in, in a good therapist? You want to find someone who has a knowledge of autism. Good tester that I do whenever I'm talking to an autism specialist, ask them about alexithymia. Ask them if they know about that. Because I know that alexithymia is very, very high, like highly comorbid with autism. It's something that a lot of autistic people experience. And it really, really does have lots of impacts when it comes to therapy, because therapy is a lot about emotions and, and experiences. If you struggle identifying and noticing your own emotions, particularly in the moment, and then tying those to events, things that you're talking about, things that you're thinking about, it's gonna make therapy a lot more difficult and it would require some awareness from the therapist. So this is just a good kind of tester that I do. You wanna make sure that they understand the likes of Imir. It's not something that's talked to, taught to every single doctor out there, every single psychotherapist. Quite often they you know, don't necessarily have all the knowledge there but you really want someone who does. You also want to ideally have someone who is also autistic, or at least has experience with people who have lived experience. They have friends, they've um, talked to and delivered therapy to other autistic people in the past and had good results. They have a family member who's autistic that they talk to. They have even a partner who's autistic that you know is engaged within the community. And you also wanna find someone who will make adjustments for you. You know, perhaps you want to go for online therapy because you found someone good. You know, it's quite hard to find someone who um, is good with autistic people in terms of psychotherapy. And so you might have to go for something that's a bit more online. You know, does that person like make it mandatory that you have your camera on? Will they let you text while they talk? Um, if that's something that you want, you might not even want that. I understand. But if they can make the adjustments to make you feel the most comfortable, when you do this therapy, that, that is a very good green flag. And of course, one thing that I think every single person on this earth who goes for therapy wants, needs, you get on with them. There's some kind of understanding, you know, you could possibly see yourself being loose friends or acquaintances with this person when you talk to them. Sometimes it might take a little bit of a while for you both to uh, know if the therapy is working, whether you get on with them, uh, but you really do have to have at least some level of like respect for that person and you have to, 
you know, feel like they understand you to some degree or they connect with you or you feel comfortable with them. Those are all really important things. So that's the main thing that I would suggest. I am going to go through some of the ways that I personally dealt with rejection sensitive dysphoria. This is the way that I do it. I'm not saying that this is the gold standard. This isn't a research method, but this is the way that I overcame my RSD. Number one, I gathered a larger sample size. For any of you who don't know, I, I went to university. I did biomedical sciences. There is a lot of statistics involved in that. I learned a lot about how scientific research was made, how facts were proven and disproven. A lot of the time, having a larger sample size of, of data allows you to be a lot more certain about whether something is right or not. When you don't have a large sample size in terms of people, and a lot of those experience are quite negative, especially when you're just coming up through school, this kind of adolescent, early 20s kind of ages, you're going to have a very large bias towards the, towards the negative. You're going to feel like there's no good people out there. You're going to feel very intense feelings of scarcity. And so one of the best ways to try and overcome that is to try and meet more people. Try and see if there is someone out there who just vibes with you, gets on with you. Doesn't necessarily have to be dating context. Um, it could be friends could be acquaintances, could be people within a group. You know, you could just loosely uh, join in with a group. You don't even have to have like a one-to-one -one conversation with someone. You could just be like listening to people uh, talk within a group or listening to, to other people having conversations. Just gather a better sample size, a bigger sample size of what, you know, human beings are like. And you, you'll undoubtedly, you'll understand that you know, you are right about the negative for, for a lot of people. <laughs> Some people don't particularly have the most favorable personality traits, um, just from my experiences, but there will be a lot of people who do. And once you find those people who do, you'll have a bit more of a grasp on like the reality of the situation and you'll feel less in that feeling of scarcity. Therefore, less intense feelings of failure and rejection because you know that there's more opportunities coming to you. Number two, and this is a lot about confidence, becoming competent and learning to truly value that internally. Now, when I was younger, I used to be quite a successful athlete. I got a lot of medals in terms of national and in international level even. Um, if you're from the UK, I went to the Commonwealth, I got a Commonwealth gold. So I'm, I, I was in no shortage of doing well at life. You know, I got into a, a good university, I got a good degree, but I still felt that difficulty when it came to feeling feelings of failure and rejection. And a lot of that was because I didn't really feel like I won that. I, I was deserving of the, the accolades that I gained. And so, you know, learning to both be good in certain areas, but also to value, like think about all the time that you put in, in order to get to, to that level of competency and genuinely feeling proud about yourself for doing that it does a lot for your self-esteem a lot for your like level of self-respect towards yourself it's very much like a muscle that you have to build confidence you can obviously fake confidence a lot of people do they say you know fake it till you make it uh, things like that i can very easily spot someone who is faking confidence it's it's very apparent. You can see it in their body language. It's just very over the top. People who are just truly confident can tend to be quite like calm. I've been around a lot of martial artists, gyms, boxing gyms, taekwondo gyms. A lot of the really, really good athletes, they tend to be like that. They're pretty chill. They don't necessarily try to like force, like forcefully dominate people or anything like that. They're just cool with themselves. They feel confident in themselves. And that's really a point that you want to get to. You don't want to be putting on this facade of confidence and getting yourself in fights and trying to dominate other people. That is definitely not the way that you want to go. You want to be able to get to a point where you see people on an equal playing field to you. Now, when I first wrote this, I was going to say, um, you see people lower than you, but that is that is also not a good way to go about it because I feel like being able to see other people as equals, whether they are like a CEO of a company, whether they are 
someone who works at McDonald's, treating people the same, seeing them as equal, I think is a really important thing because it turns less from this action of, all oh, right, I'm, I'm really not like a, a great person. I haven't really had a lot of relationships. I haven't had a lot of friends. Um, you know, I have a, a lot of negative experiences with people who's going to like me. Um, you, you, you are automatically putting yourself on a lower, like a lower level than the people that you're talking to. So it's going to feel a lot more intense when people do that. And if you're thinking that you're higher than people, um, as soon as some piece of information comes across, uh, that, you know, they say or the way that they react, it's equally going to have a bad reaction for you because you'd be like, oh, so I'm not actually better than this person. So you, you, seeing people on an equal playing field, it's a really good kind of goal to try and aim for. When you when you see it as just two in, humans interacting, seeing if they get on, and if they don't, it's good, and if they do, it's good. It does a lot for you. You get to a point, especially when you when you become confident, <laughs> competent in yourself, and and therefore feel comfortable where you are, who you are. You seek less validation externally. Now there is a lot of stuff out there on the internet that says validation is bad. I I, I disagree. I feel like validation is something that should be reserved for people who are very close to you, and especially not strangers, not people that you don't know, that pe people that don't know you. If someone in my life was to say, oh, Tom, you're a horrible person, you look like, you look terrible, that's going to have a bit more of an impact on me emotionally and going to make me feel a bit worse than if it was, you know, some randomer on YouTube who's watched like, 60 seconds of my video and made a comment. So there's, there's there's levels to it. And I think once you can stop trying to validate yourself through the attention or the positive affirmation from strangers, uh, you're in a good place. And lastly, grounding and reality checks. This is a really, really important thing. This pulls you back to earth when you when your brain is blown out with failure and rejection and you're feeling like your world is collapsing and you're never going to find anyone no one's going to like you and you're always going to do badly and you know everything like that you really want to have these in your back pocket these things to remember these grounding reality checks whatever you want to call them what do they look like well it's recognizing that the world is a little bit more complex than what you perceive it as there is a lot of factors that go into someone um, failing and also a lot of factors that go into someone getting rejected. This means if you are being rejected by somebody, you assume that all of the blame is on you, that you're not good enough, that you've done something wrong. There is an element of that, obviously, like in a lot of situations, um, and it's something that you can improve in terms of communicating well with other people. But to a certain point, it's not necessarily all on you there's a lot of different factors involved. What headspace are they in? Is their mental health good? You know, they could be feeling really, really bad at the moment, really low self-esteem. They could be feeling exactly how you do and wanting to protect themselves. You know, they could just be a, you know, genuinely quite narcissistic person. Uh, th there's, there's lots of different factors involved in that and personal preferences. Perhaps they just, you, you're not the type of person that they find attractive. You're not the type of person that they'd usually have be friends with. You know, you might not have the similar hobbies that they really like in friends. Uh, you might have differing communication styles, which is a big thing for um, autistic people. The environment, you know, there's a difference between going up and asking someone at a, on a date or to, to go out and do something. At like it was one of those events where, where people go and singles nights. <laughs> I saw something recently about singles nights. I feel like those things have really gone out of fashion just from some of the stuff that I've seen online. But you're more likely to get a positive response in those circumstances because people are looking to date. They're like, you know that they are. Um, whereas if you just approach someone behind them, like when they're doing their shopping and they're trying to get home from work and, you know, they've got something on in a bit, uh, perhaps that's not the best time to start a conversation with somebody, you know, like at the supermarket checkout might not be the best idea. That's, that's a fact, factor to consider. They might also have biases. They might be quite discriminatory in a sense. It's something that some people experience. Then they're not always outward about it. They may know that you're autistic, 
they may not want to say that they don't want to date you or be friends with you because you're autistic because that would be you know like ableist not cool in the eyes of most people uh, but it, they might feel like the way that way and that's that's not your fault they may also lack autism awareness education uh, a lot of people do it's not something that's embedded within the school system for people to know this stuff or with embedded within workplaces or within mainstream media to really understand what autism is how it comes across some of the misconceptions the stigmas there's so much the thing that i want to get across with this slide is that there are so many things involved in this that is not related to you and this isn't saying hey look blame everything else <laughs> there's nothing that you could do differently in this situation this is just bringing a bit bit back to reality this is saying like okay you know perhaps there is a little bit or quite a bit from from my end but perhaps there's other stuff involved in that and i should not feel as rejected in that sense it could just you know it could be their loss it could be you know sometimes you do have to have that kind of attitude in order to um, get used to feelings of failure and rejection there's a lot of guys that i've seen out there who have like got over their feelings like their fear of being rejected by approaching lots of women and asking them for dates and getting rejected this is something that i've seen online and it's you know it's it's definitely true like the more experience that you have with it the more that you don't necessarily live in scarcity um, in any circumstance whether it whether it is getting jobs whether it's friends whether it's dating um you will feel a lot better but that is something to develop in time these are these are things that i've developed in the long term it's not like one day i've decided flip right i'm gonna stop doing this <laughs> a lot of changes to your thought patterns the way that you view things uh, if you're trying to make some really big change about yourself it's obviously going to take a lot more time to change to develop and that's cool and it's just about you see yourself slip in bring yourself back to reality focus on getting competent gathering a large sample size um, all of these things if you do those i'm sure that you'll get to a point where, where like me where i don't feel those intense feelings when it comes to failure and rejection it does happen of course not gonna lie it's not like something that goes away but it's not overbearingly bad it's not like my life's ended so let's think about some of the caveats uh, to what i'm talking about before we end up this video it may feel like you're shifting that that kind of personal accountability that i was talking about the thing is in this circumstances you are already taking way too much accountability for the outcome of this if you don't why are you watching this video <laughs> you know okay you might be interested in, in what i have to say um but if you are experiencing rsd it's very likely that you need to shift some of the accountability away from yourself at least to a little bit and take on those you know very possibilities of, of what might be going on behind the scenes uh it's not a, f a free pass to treat others badly or feel depressed it's just understanding the situation this doesn't mean that you can be like oh okay yeah i've not got any scarcity i hate everybody um <laughs> you know oh, they should like me and the only reason why they don't is because of all these other circumstances you know you just get you go in the opposite way you <laughs> where you need to be and also don't feel depressed that it's you're not always going to succeed in situations this is not a video about how to stop being rejected stop experiencing failure that is very dependent on lots of different factors uh, some of those factors being yourself you know what you do so it's not about being rejected less it's just about processing and reacting to failure and rejection properly and not letting it consume you dating workplaces platonic familial relationships obviously all have their own individual nuances when it comes to feelings of rejection and failures it's obviously going to be very dependent on the person the situation but all in all i really hope that you have enjoyed this video and if you have make sure to leave it a like drop me a subscribe if you want to see some more stuff from me and if you want me to continue making these videos i'm trying to grow my channel trying to get myself out there trying new stuff uh, doing these videos is one of them and um, if you want me to continue doing that you can support me for as little as 99p a month uh, for a youtube membership you get a little infinity badge next to your name uh, that you can use when you comment when you join the lives and um i would really appreciate that follow the social medias and i'll see you guys in another video check this check this video as well that's that's a cool video definitely 
See you later.